Welcome to One for the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use. I'm national financial columnist and talk show host, Steve Savant. And on today's show, protecting your money goals. We all have goals we want to achieve in life, and protecting those assets is an important part of those goals. But were you aware you could protect your assets from creditors, dictate who receives those assets, and how they're used, even from the grave? And to help us understand how to protect your assets, achieve our money goals, and extend our influence into the next generation, national columnist and attorney at law, Ike Devji, asset protection consultant and recognized expert in defensive financial planning, all here on One for the Money. Well, welcome to the show, Ike. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you being here. I mean, you are a national columnist on all that is asset protection, but you also do a lot of good work in front-end personal wills. We're talking about the advantages of durable power of attorney, basic trust work. You know, we, we like that. We need. We want to make sure all our consumers understand what's out there and what it can do for you. And when I think about you being an attorney on top of this, you're you're very articulate in your articles, and I even get it on the first pass. So it must be pretty good, pretty pretty good writing on your part. I want to talk to you and get into something right away because I probably get email, especially on this one subject. Not so much on the wills, not so much on the trust, but on healthcare directives. How important is it to already tell your beneficiaries or actually select a directive, a director for your healthcare? in case something happens and you can't do it? Well, Steve, it's a great question, and I think it's very important. Uh, There are things that we plan against that many times are in the realm of possibility. This is one of those things that, for almost all of us, is is a certainty at some point in Mm -hmm. our life. We are going to be at a point, um, whether it's in the future or sooner than we expect, where we're going to need medical care, where we're going to need help, where we are going to want those decisions known in a clear and predictable way. And uh, this is the responsible way to do it. It protects you and it protects those you love as well in a, in a time where they're already under a lot of stress. Now, do you attach this to a regular will or is this part of a living trust? What, what document? Is it standalone or is it actually attached to one of those two documents? That's, that's an important issue. It can be done either way. Uh, In some cases, we will see it executed uh, a little bit later than we like when somebody goes into the hospital or right before medical care is delivered. If somebody is, for instance, having scheduled surgery and they don't have these issues addressed, they'll do that. In other cases, ideally, we'll have done it beforehand Mm. where the client has had the ability to put some time and thought into it and have those important discussions with the family members who are going to be there to help them through it. So what I'm thinking, and I've always thought, and maybe erroneously, I've always thought that this is kind of part of the living will. You know, you're kind of really expressing your, your last days, your kind of end of life planning. So if I'm thinking about this, should it be a relative or should it be somebody completely dispassionate? I think that varies from family to family. One of the landmark cases that everybody in the country is familiar with is the tragedy in Florida that happened with Terry Scheibel. Oh. Mm. And the extended suffering that she and her family members went through, the expense, uh, the national media attention, the court costs, the Mm. legal fees, could have been avoided with a little bit of forethought. Um, And so really it's got to be an individual decision that's based on who do you have around you? Is that person going to be able to follow your wishes as opposed to follow the perhaps uh, emotional Mm -hmm. and personal ties that they have. Can somebody close to you make those decisions in that objective way? Mm -hmm. If you don't feel that you have that person in your family or that the emotional issues may control, you may want to look at a third party. Well, what about a basic will? Now, everybody knows we should have a will. Give me the basic characteristics of a simple will that everybody can do because it's not that I don't think it's that expensive to have an attorney draw it up so talk a little bit about a basic will that's that's a great point a a basic will is a very affordable tool Um, it does provide a great deal of surety in terms of being able to give specific parts of your estate or specific assets to specific people Um, and I think that everybody should know that 
whether your state is a state that has a good probate process or a bad probate mm -hmm. process, controlling the disposition of everything you've, you're going to leave behind through a, at least a will is always a better alternative than the expense and delay mm -hmm. and additional stress of the probate process. Okay, so when I'm, I'm putting together a will, give me a couple basic characteristics that I need to have in my will. Well, number one, it's got to be executed when you have the capacity mm -hmm. to execute it. So many times what we see is that people don't execute a will until they are facing some kind of duress or emergency. Um, it could be that someone is struck with an illness or is going in for a serious surgery uh, or is incapacitated mm -hmm. in an accident. And at that point, somebody comes in at the last minute with a sheaf of papers. Mm -hmm. And if we have a, con a, a question of whether mm -hmm. that person had the legal, mental, physical capacity to execute that, um, that weakens what we're trying to achieve. That could really cause a, um, a heartbreak in a family. It can cause a heartbreak. It can cause mm. disputes that are expensive. Mm. So the first one is really a timing issue mm. right, when we're talking about capacity. The second one is that it's got to be um, legally enforceable. Every state has a very specific set of guidelines that control how a will is drafted, mm -hmm. how it must be witnessed and proved up to be legitimate. And those are the two most basic things that we look at is did the person have capacity mm -hmm. and did it comply with the laws of the state in order to make it enforceable. Mm -hmm. Those are two critical pieces that you want to be able to input into your will. And when we come back from the break, we're going to talk more about some of the other issues, beneficiaries, who gets what, and all these things that sometimes can cause huge family disagreements and heartache. We're going to try to map that out and put it on a very easy to understand segment right after we come back from the break. Did you know the average 401k runs out of money just seven to eight years into retirement? Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications have warned of the difficulty of saving with a 401k. But what if there was a way to create tax-free lifetime retirement income with no stock market risk? Good news, there is. You know, living in fear of the next market dive is not the way I want to live my life. Why would I go out there and take on risk when I don't need to? I have a lot less stress knowing I can't lose any more of my retirement savings in the stock market. Call now to receive your free, no obligation analysis of what this retirement vehicle could do for you. A comparison to your current retirement plan and a free video that explains this exciting opportunity. Start planning a retirement you can enjoy instead of worrying about future tax increases and stock market losses. Creating income that will last your entire life is the most important thing you'll ever do. Take control of your future. Call now for your free analysis, comparison, and video. Well, welcome back to our Two for the Show segment. I'm with attorney and national author, Ike Devji, and he's talking about wills and trusts and things like that. Well, we haven't got really into trust yet, but let's talk about the will. I, I want to talk about guardianship for minor children. That seems to be a hot issue, and especially with not only traditional families, but also with blended families. Talk a little bit about that, because that's an important issue. It's a very important issue, Steve, you're correct. The decision of as to who is going to have the primary legal responsibility to care for your children who are under the age of 18 or to control assets on their behalf is one of the most essential and important reasons to do any kind of estate planning. And in fact, when we talk about estate planning and asset protection, most people's most valued asset is their children. At the end of the day, it's the thing they care about the most. So making those decisions beforehand mm -hmm. and having perhaps the conversation with the person who you would uh, delegate or nominate to be in that position mm -hmm. is a indispensable part of any company. Now, now they need plan. to accept that responsibility, right? You just can't tag somebody to do that. I mean, you have to actually say, are you willing to take care of my children and their finance and education if something happens to me? Legally, you can name anyone you want. I think ethically and responsibility, and, and uh, from, a, from an ethical sense and from a sense of responsibility, it is more appropriate mm -hmm. to have that conversation and not surprise somebody with that responsibility. Now, I, I noticed, I thought I heard you a little in your, in your voice there a bit about if I, have, uh, if I have children that I'm not really sure are ready to receive assets, can I dictate from the grave, so to speak? what they can and cannot do and what they can you get access to? Not only can you, you should. Uh, I think everyone who's watching knows someone perhaps that they met in college or mm -hmm. later in life 
who got a large sum of money from an estate. And there are some people who make uh, productive use of that, but I would say that giving most 18 to 22 year olds a large lump sum of cash is not productive in most cases. So yes, that is part of the planning. It's an important part of the planning. You can control uh, what they get, how they get it, when they get it. We typically see provisions, for instance, that might stagger the distribution mm -hmm. of an estate at 21, 25, and 30, mm. as one example, in equal thirds. Um, the trustee of the estate will have the ability to advance funds for things that are important to both the grantor, the person who created the trust, and mm -hmm. the beneficiaries, the pre people who are left well, behind. Well, I just heard you say another thing, then. So it's important to choose the executor, uh, whoever's going to be the executor of the trust, it's important to choose that person because he's going to have to execute and maybe actually be a firewall to this young man who wants to spend you know, money right now and it's already written out. He has to make sure that will is executed exactly the way it was intended. That's absolutely correct. That person is, in essence, especially for minor children, not only a guardian, let's assume it's the same person, Oh, so and it, it doesn't be. have could to be. be. It doesn't have to be, okay. Absolutely. That person is a guardian not only of the physical being of the child, but of the assets that you mm -hmm. left to care for the child. And so there is a certain amount of legal paperwork and financial acumen and things that need to be addressed. What if I make a bequest outside my family? Is that an issue? I mean, I have individuals that maybe I want to do something for. They're not really blood relatives. They're just people I want to be able to put in my will. Is there any really difference between my blood family and how they are as my beneficiaries and you know, making a bequest to individuals who are not related to me? I think that if you have that intent, and many of the people that we work with do, they mm -hmm. have a, a friend or a business partner, and many times a bequest um, is not just the transfer of a lump sum of cash or some cash equivalent asset, it might be a physical item, a piece of personal property of great significant value. Um, we recently worked with a client who uh, is transferring his prize collection of hunting rifles to his best friends, the, the best friend that he has hunted with for the last 30 years. Um, so that is one example of you know, a specific item of personal mm -hmm. property. But yes, I think it's a good idea to memorialize that, mm -hmm. especially in an age where we have increased estate litigation, where the people you leave behind who are in your direct family, absent that very specific writing and intent, mm -hmm. may object to that transfer. Now, I, I'm just, with, with what time we have left, how important is it to discuss this with your children and your, because those are your, basically your beneficiaries, how important is it to get this on the table? I think it's important, but I also realize that it's a very difficult conversation for mm. people to have. Um, you know the kind of people that we work with. Many of them are very affluent, very successful. Sometimes the estates are average, middle class, upper middle class families. Sometimes they are extraordinary. Um, in both cases, there's always a hesitation to give people an anticipation. Um, but in an ideal world, you would let people know that you had some specific intents, that there were some wishes that you'd expressed and wanted followed, mm. and maybe even some detail on what those wishes actually are. Well, when we're thinking about constructing a will, we're going to talk about in the next segment some of the components to prepare you for your first meeting with an attorney. I mean, many people, this will be their first opportunity to sit down with an attorney and really map out their heart, their will, their desires, things that they want to transfer to the next generation or to individuals as we've discussed. So we come back from the break, more with Ike and all these things that we should be doing about wills and trusts. Did you know the average 401k runs out of money just seven to eight years into retirement? Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications have warned of the difficulty of saving with a 401k. But what if there was a way to create tax-free lifetime retirement income with no stock market risk? Good news, there is. You know, living in fear of the next market dive is not the way I want to live my life. Why would I go out there and take on risk when I don't need to? I have a lot less stress knowing I can't lose any more of my retirement savings in the stock market. Call now to receive your free, no obligation analysis of what this retirement vehicle could do for you. A comparison to your current retirement plan and a free video that explains this exciting opportunity. Start planning a retirement you can enjoy instead of worrying about future tax increases and stock market losses. Creating income that will last your entire life is the most important thing you'll ever do. Take control of your future. Call now for your free analysis, comparison, and video. 
Well, welcome back to our three to get ready segment, and we're with attorney <laughs> Ike Devji. You know, Ike, I, the reason I'm laughing is because everybody that I talk to knows we're supposed to be doing all this, and yet there's such a minority in our population that actually do what we're talking about on the show, and it really matters. So I, I'm always surprised when we get through this. Uh, we're going to get email. We're going to receive the kind of traffic we get on the internet just because we're talking about basic concepts. Now, if I'm going to get ready to meet with an attorney, and remember, many of our viewers, this may be their first time talking to an attorney, and they want to talk about basic will, and in a moment we'll get into revocable living trust. Tell me, what do I need to prepare for my first meeting? I think there's a, there's, a, there's a good standard basic list of things that um, we typically would ask a client to bring to a meeting. I'll get into that list in just a second, but I also think it's important that the folks coming in, let's assume for a moment that we're talking about a married couple, have a conversation about these issues at home before, before they come they in as in. well. Oh, yeah. Because it's important, I'm gonna, when they come in, somebody like me is going to ask them specific questions. It's a good idea if you've thought about some of those issues beforehand. Well, so can you give us, I mean, can you send to the client before he meets with you these lists of questions that they need to discuss before they see you? Absolutely, absolutely. And that I think that conversation is an important precursor to the meeting itself and to even completing the list. So some of the most basic things on the list would be, number one, if you have minor children, who do you want the guardians of those children to be? That's one of the key and most important issues. Number two, if there are minor children who require that they have somebody who is appointed to manage the assets of the estate, the property, uh -huh. the investments, the other things that you might be leaving behind for their benefit, is the person who you appointed as the guardian equally qualified to handle the money? So they might be two different people. They could be two different people because remember, somebody who might be the best mm -hmm. caregiver might not be the best money manager. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we need to divide those things, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. But that's a question that's individual to every family. Another important and key issue is a list of the assets that you're leaving. What is it that you want the attorney's help to handle and distribute? The attorney can only give you good advice and, and create provisions and create documents based on what you give him. Uh, it's a garbage in, garbage out kind mm -hmm. of uh, analogy. If you give us a great deal of complete information of all of the assets that we need to be um, advising you about dis mm -hmm. disposing of, then we can provide the best advice. And I mean, we have to go through an inventory of our entire house. I mean, there's things in there. When I started looking through, I said, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. I had to go through like I was doing a property casualty audit for my protection of my home, my homeowner's insurance policy, just to say, well, look at all these things I would have never thought about. That is absolutely correct. And people always underestimate hmm. the value of the personal property and the uh, personal items that they have in their home. And they don't think about those things until it's often too late. Mm. Who did, I want my father's gold watch to go to my oldest oh, son. Yeah. I want my mother's wedding ring to go to my daughter. Those kinds of things that have great emotional value are also many times the subject of conflict oh, between yeah. families. No, no, is, is things like this, is, is, are we starting to move towards the revocable living trust, which is really a potpourri of many documents inside it? It is, it is. And one, one important question that we help clients figure out mm. is do I need a will or a trust? And so that distinction is important. But let's move to the trust for a moment. And, and as you said, the trust is not one thing. Uh, a, a good revocable living trust is in fact a collection of a series of documents that help control all of the things that you've talked about. It will include the vital issues of the health care powers of attorney and living will that you mentioned. It will include uh, a choice of a guardian for minor children. It mm -hmm. will in include the choice of a trustee who is responsible for the disposition of the assets in the estate. Uh, it has a number of different documents that form that and that is why it has been such a powerful and effective tool and it is within the reach of most most people. Mm -hmm. Well, when I think about a living trust, I think of, and I'm probably just the same as any consumer, I think, hey, it's one doc, three or four pages long, I fill it out and I'm done. But you're not, you're saying it's a collection of all these. And do they have to integrate? Do they have to be part, you know, to, to kind, of, kind of work in synergy? 
Absolutely, Steve, that's a great point. We don't want things that are created at different times by different people um, with a different view of the grantor, the, mm. the person creating the will or the trust and, and what their estate is. They must absolutely work together. There shouldn't be any conflict inherent to mm -hmm. the document. And it should be clearly stated as to who receives what, when, how. How many times should I look at this as we're heading to the end of the segment? How many times do I need to update this and do a review? There are a kind of standard set of life changes that attorneys look at. Have you had another child? Mm. Have you had a change, significant change in the assets that the trust or will was uh, was created to address. Mm -hmm. So basically we're talking about life events that are going to dictate and change the way we think about things. And really there's a whole list that if you go out to our site, we'll give you a list of all the life events that would really be helpful to take to this to, to your first attorney's meeting. We'll be right back after the break with Ike. Did you know the average 401k runs out of money just seven to eight years into retirement? Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications have warned of the difficulty of saving with a 401k. But what if there was a way to create tax-free lifetime retirement income with no stock market risk? Good news, there is. You know, living in fear of the next market dive is not the way I want to live my life. Why would I go out there and take on risk when I don't need to? I have a lot less stress knowing I can't lose any more of my retirement savings in the stock market. Call now to receive your free, no obligation analysis of what this retirement vehicle could do for you. A comparison to your current retirement plan and a free video that explains this exciting opportunity. Start planning a retirement you can enjoy instead of worrying about future tax increases and stock market losses. Creating income that will last your entire life is the most important important thing you'll ever do. Take control of your future. Call now for your free analysis, comparison, and video. Well, welcome back to our Four to Go segment with Ike Devji, attorney at law and national consultant and author. And I've seen you in a lot of magazines, Ike, and especially at the higher end with doctors, physicians, attorneys, different people that really use your services for asset protection. But when we're talking in a regular show like this, I'm really looking at the list now. We talked about the list in a, some of the things we wanted in a will, but when we talk about a revocable living trust, and I'm assuming that the word revocable means you can change it. That's exactly it. And now that's why I always get afraid about using the word irrevocable or irrevocable, depending upon your pronunciation. But a revocable, you could change your mind where you're still in good mind. You have the mental capacity to make this happen. So it's not in concrete. But how many documents? I mean, there's so many documents that are inserted in this trust. It's as you said in the last segment, there's several. For us to prepare our next steps, what are those documents going to be so that we can be ready to go with our attorney? Well, that, that's a great question because as you said, the revocable living trust is the sum of its parts. Uh, some of the basic parts would include the dispositive provisions that you would find in a will. So for instance, who gets what, when, mm -hmm. and how. That's number one. Number two, it, it often uh, or almost always designates a specific trustee people, uh, it could be a living person or it could be a corporate entity uh, that is a professional fiduciary that is responsible for executing the wishes expressed mm -hmm. and, and conducting and closing the, the estate's affairs. Could it, be, could it be one of your children? It absolutely can be a beneficiary. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Though? Uh, Steve, that's a really good question and it's really specific to each individual family. Mm -hmm. Every family might have two children of, of, of close age. One might be exceptionally responsible and have a great deal of financial acumen. Mm -hmm. And the other one might be a little bit more of a free spirit who is not as good as hanging on, at good as hanging on to money. Oh, you say that so <laughs> delicately, Ike. Very political. Okay, so what else do I need then? Uh, I would say that the, the health care powers of attorney, the mm -hmm. living will portions, uh, the things that we talked about earlier, those things are covered in, in great detail. Mm -hmm. Uh, the attorney will ask clients if they want, for instance, uh, extraordinary measures, if they want to be kept on life support, uh, uh -huh. what kind of pain management they would like uh, to have as part of their uh, treatment oh. program. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Just, you just crossed my line there on that one. So you can tell in your side your revocable living trust on one of your docs, you can actually dictate how far up you're willing to live on whatever medication, high-end pain medication. I'm sorry, but that's new to me. Talk a little bit about that. Well, 
there, the physician's job, and because of the liability issues that doctors face as well, is to keep this person alive no matter what, no matter how devastating the injury, no matter how devastating the illness that might be, no matter how much capacity they might lack. Mm -hmm. There are many people who decide that if they're completely incapacitated or have a certain level of pain that will always be part of um, whatever future they have left in the event of something dramatic happening, that there are measures that they do or do not want to subject their bodies and their families mm -hmm. to. So there's a lot of minute detail mm. there, and it can get right down to that level. Wow. Um, you that's know, very specific. I it, mean, that's it can, managing it pretty tight. It is managing it pretty tight. So that means that the conversations that you suggested that we have earlier um, before we have these meetings are that much more important when designating someone mm. with the trust of handling, literally having your life in their hands. What other documents do am I going to see in the overall revocable living trust? You're going to see in some cases things like an AB bypass trust, which is a way to control assets um, between spouses so that the surviving spouse and the living spouse have taken advantage. Now, I'm curious about that because I thought the medical, or the, not the medical, the marital deduction uh, you know, uh, that, that comes with it, the act that was done in 1981, I thought that already did that for us. You know, there, there are certain provisions that we put into advanced estate planning documents depending on the size of the estate, the complexity of the estate. If it's a blended family, there are other issues that we may look at. Um, we're seeing this more and more commonly where we have people who are independently successful mm. meeting later in life with children and assets that are going to be distributed to different people in uh. different ways. So all of these things come into play, and it's a very individual determination, which is why that we don't like people using form documents that may or may not really conform mm. to their life, their family, their reality. Well, I have a question because I saw this on one of our questions. What, what is a pour over will? A pour over will is basically a way to include assets in the estate and address their disposition and assign control and beneficiaries for things that were not explicitly included in the main estate planning like a, document. Is that like a document that's post-mortem? You already did your revocable trust and then you found other items that you need to insert? Or well, I, I'm trying it, to figure this out because it seems like it's an add-on. It, it is and it isn't. For instance, when most people create a revocable living trust, they hit all the big stuff. Where does the house go? Where do the investment accounts go? Mm. All of the big things. But there are many other things that may be of significant mm. uh, either financial or, emo uh, or uh, emotional value mm. that should be addressed and can be encompassed in that way. All these things are what we're talking about with Ike Devja, and now we've prepared you to meet with your attorney. Remember, we have the defensive strategies to help you protect your money goals in life, and we've partnered with financial professionals who know the value of money and its impact on your retirement. For more information on wills, trusts, ownership arrangements that can help protect your money for retirement, just go off to the show's website at www.onefortheMoney.tv. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter and visit me on all our social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Google+. That's 